Okay, hello everybody, and thanks for uh, coming, coming back after lunch. Um, uh, so when, when, you know, I think when most people think about anticline pools, um, and the ecology of anticline pools, the first thing that come to mind are shrimp, um, for very good reason. Um, and, and the second thing that come to mind, at least for me, after the last couple of days, are um, um, microbe, um, microbe communities. Um, they, they certainly are dominant, but, but I think but many people don't recognize that um, anchorland pools um, are also um, provide critical habitat for um, for damselflies. So I kind of want to use this opportunity to um, to raise awareness a bit for for this arthropod species. Um, I just want to acknowledge before I start, um, kind of my co-author on this, Sarah Nash, who's who's, um, who's really helped a lot, kind of moving this this project towards completion. So damselflies are part of the, um, the order Odonata, which includes um, dragonflies. And uh, in Hawaii, the, well, the, the genus Megalagrion is an endemic genus, and there's been um, at least 28 species or subspecies uh, identified. 14 of those um, are endemic to single islands. Two of the species are known historically from the entire chain, and unfortunately, six species are listed as endangered. Um, Oh, all the odonates um, primarily have an aquatic larval stage, and they, they breathe um, basically through gill structures on the tip of their abdomen. Um, and considering this is Hawaii, and given almost 10, year, 10, 10 million years of evolution, um, uh, the endemic megalagrium have been evolved into uh, resided habitats that are atypical for damselflies, including vertical seats, um, acidic bogs, uh, the leaf axles of trees in the wet forests, and even in leaf litter that remains moist. Um, quite remarkable habitats. But I want to focus on the species um, Megalagran xanthomelis, which is the orange-black Hawaiian damselfly. Um, and it was listed as endangered in 2016. And uh, looking at its distribution um, and, and number of populations, it may be a bit surprising that it's endangered. Um, so there's at least 20 populations that have been identified at least in the mid-1990s. Um, and, uh, sorry, and, yeah, so, but each of these populations are, um, are relatively small in size, at least most of them are relatively small in size, and some of them are even singletons, um, or just a couple of individuals have been identified, and they're all probably geographically isolated. Um, so there's been quite a change in their distribution. And there's even several populations that have been extirpated um, in the recent past. And one example is this one population at Popoho, and that population was lost due to the 19th to 2018 um, Kilauea lava flow. Uh, so ironically, the kind of late great entomologist um, RCL Perkins at the end of the 1890s commented that um, the, the species was a common insect in Honolulu Gardens, um, very numerous and conditions changed from natural, so unnatural conditions. And, and that last bit I think is important, is it, it says that it can um, adapt to um, uh, environments that are not pristine and kind of gives hope for, um, hope for its uh, restoration in the future. Um, Xanthomelis um, habitat, it's a, a lowland and coastal species. Um, it's found in a variety of habitats in that environment from kind of slow moving streams to ponds. The top two photographs show kind of uh, the interface between freshwater springs and, um, and ocean water. Those are um, estuarine habitats. The lower left is a Pelicuna Valley, which is a ponded part of the stream just behind um, the beach berm. And, and then the, the, the two pictures on the lower right kind of show a, um, a kind of a remarkable population that's um, at Tripler um, Army uh, Medical Center in Oahu. And, uh, and this population, the entire population, was in uh, a, a length of stream that's about 100 meters in length. Um, and to try to augment this habitat, um, there had been artificial ponds that had been used in the past. Um, and up until fairly recently, <coughs> this, this stream habitat was um, supplied through a garden hose, and that was the, the once continuous stream became intermittent after after um, development upstream of that. It, it's a it's truly really quite a remarkable story, and if you want to um, know more about that, I suggest you talk to Will Haynes or Cynthia King. They've been doing a lot of work with this population um, and trying to um, establish other um, populations on Oahu. But it's a yeah, it's quite a remarkable story. Um, Xanthomelis, um, 
in Anculan pools is what I want to focus on. Um, I don't need to tell you guys much about Anculan pools after after the last couple of days, um, but a couple things are notable, and that's the um, in terms of, of the, the dry ground supply anyway, and that's when the water conditions change with tides. We all know that it, um, either in, in temperature, salinity, other um, physiochemical features, but also some of them dewater during low tide, and that's critical because if they dewater at all, then it's, it's habitat that's, that's inhospitable to the dam supplies. We know the species diversity is low. These are pretty simple, um, pretty simple ecosystems. And importantly, the, some of these pools form complexes um, during high tide events. And sometimes these high tide events are, they only happen a few times a year. Um, really high tides, and, and that's important in the sense of invasive fish that we've already heard a lot about. Um, and so it can impact habitat. This work was done at Kalopohonokoha National Historical Park. We've already heard a bit about it. Um, it's an it's a, it's a amazing park just north of here. Um, it's only about a, um, about a mile in length. Um, and it was uh, the main features that it, it protects um, are the Kolopa fish pond up here and the Anapapa fish pond, pond, but also all kinds of other important cultural features. Um, those ponds and surely would have been habitat in the past. Yellow dots are ankyline pools and it supports some of the highest density of ankyline pools, um, certainly on the Kona coast and not the state. Um, the, the, the lava kind of structure everywhere, it's, it's pretty young, but most of the most of the um, ankyline pools are kind of in this young flow that's um, probably about three to 5,000 years in age. Photos on the left just kind of show representative habitat. This is one that's, that's um, has had um, human um, influence over the past. This is on the, the margins of um, Tolopa fish pond. This is out on the, the young lava flow, but only this pool right here um, has supported dam supplies, at least in the recent past. Um, so the objectives of, of this work was to, one, estimate the population size. Uh, another is to identify where eggs are being laid or the overposition sites based on overposition behaviors to try to characterize the pools in terms of their structure and a little bit about their water quality. And then consider threats um, and opportunities to expand this population. And a lot of this is speculative. We don't know very much about threats, but um, there's plenty to consider. And this is just the general area of where the population uh, exists. Before we started our study, um, we identified where the where pop populations existed, which pools were occupied, either based on our own surveys or national park data or other people's data. And then we divided the pools into what we consider either core pools or peripheral pools. And those were a bit arbitrary, but core pools were considered those pools where, where dam supplies have, have been known for a long time, or at least you know, they're continuously present. Um, and they were considered to support potentially breeding populations. Where the peripheral pools, um, camp supplies were, were more occasionally observed and considered more marginal habitat. Um, and uh, most of these are only within 10 to 20 meters apart, but there's one core pool that's about 160 meters from kind of this core population. And they all exist within kind of this kipuka vegetation um, surrounded by this really young lava flow. And I, it's no coincidence, I'm sure, that these pools that are out here don't support dam supplies. Just um, really quickly, I wanted to just say that um, the 2011 um, tsunami that was based off of Japan actually came across here and inundated this pool here with sediment, and at least it's become one of the, one of the a peripheral, a peripheral pool. This just gives you an idea of what the pools look like. Um, the pools at the top, I didn't say that there were seven, um, seven core pools and four peripheral pools. This figure shows. Six of, the, six of the core pools at the top, and then three of the four peripheral pools at the bottom. What they share in common is that um, all of them have vegetation, either peripheral vegetation or emergent vegetation, and none of them dewater, even during the lowest um, tide events. None of the core pools um, contain any invasive fish, or two of the four um, peripheral pools do contain fish. And this is that, oops, real quickly, this is the pool where this, this here, this is a kind of a sediment load from that tsunami that dumped in there of sediments, and it's been established by invasive pickleweed, but um, it does support at least male dams of flies on occasion. So we, um, so, so yeah, to, in order to kind of measure the abundance um, of dam supplies at these pools, we visited the core pools one to two times per month. Um, 
during 2000, uh, June 2016 to August 2017, our standard observations were 15 minutes at each pool. And these pools were generally small enough where we could, we could um, see the entire pool. Um, and 15 minutes was really enough to work. If there's a dam supply present, then it was probably going to move. Um, um, and if not, we were just kind of um, gently sweep the vegetation to make sure we didn't miss anything. The figures on the left show, is, show those results for the seven core pools, and then down in the bottom right is for all the pools combined. Um, the abundance ranged from six to 29 individuals. So even uh, at the greatest abundance, it was still a pretty small population size. The males are shown in blue, and the females are shown in orange. And overall, males are 6.1 times more abundant than females in these pools. Um, Females were, were rarely seen when they're not in tandem. In the next slide, I have a picture of them in tandem, but, but the, female, the, the male will, will clasp onto the females. It's a, it's a form of, of sperm guarding, and they fly around together. And so when females were seen, they were generally in tandem or sometimes overpositing by themselves, but I think they were avoiding these pools if they were not in a reproductive status. Otherwise, they would be harassed by males. Um, and, and males do defend territories. They're extremely territorial, so you often see male-male interactions. Um, and use it super brief, less a second, uh, maybe two at the most, and then the victor would go back to his perch and the other one would either leave the pool or go to a, a less desirable part of the pool. Uh, we tried to identify where angling was taking place, so we measured what we call OVA, OVA position behavior, and we can't say for sure that eggs were being laid because it was very difficult you know, to, to see that this is the female and she's, she's probing on the surface of this Twig and you kind of see the male in tandem with her, um, but, but but we're kind of making the assumption that when we're seeing these probing behaviors, um, these, these slow behaviors, um, then that's representative of, of egg laying. But it's very difficult to, to know for sure. Um, we observed pools for about an hour, and those are the pools were earlier in the day, in the morning, that we saw females to be present. So then we sat at the pools and we we um, observed what they were positing on. We were considering independent observations only if, if, the, if the pair would move to a new substrate. So if it was probing, probing, then that was still only one observation. We observed um, basically the substrate, whether it was branch, branches going to the water, it's, um, leaves, rocks, um, or something else. And, um, and then the position above, um, above, at, or below the surface. Can I just ask, is that three minutes for the full 15? Or for, okay, sorry. And move along here, and so yeah, these were the, the results for that. Um, basically, here these were all for all four pools, and um, small branches were by far the most common. And then above the water, they were most common too. And look, that the previous slide was showing that it was wet. It was above the water, but that was wet, indicating that um, that, that during high tide it would be submerged. Um, for pool characteristics, we measured. I just really want to point out the salinity range. 9.7 to 14.1 was a full range for core and peripheral pools. And for canopy cover, um, the lowest was about 11, um, and then the highest was, was almost 100%, almost complete cover. So that's the common theme is that there's cover. Kind of, you know, what limits, we, we don't really know. Um, you know, we, we know that cover is important, probably as perching sites or, or you know, open position substrates. And there's this whole suite of predators that are involved that, that we really don't know what their impacts are, but from an OLE, they're all introduced. Yellow crazing ants are probably our greatest concern um, because as the males come out before they can fly, they're really vulnerable for a, for a while and they can easily be um, preyed upon. Um, the maniads, you have to think of them as, as completely separate limiting factors. Uh, we know that fish are important, um, and um, but also water quality. And um, Blair Tongo, a number of years ago, she um, showed that as salinity increases, particularly to like 15 or 20 percent, then the survival of naiads decreases significantly. And remember that our high salinity we had was 14.1 percent. Um, and then food availability is, is something else that we know absolutely nothing about. Um, and if anybody has any ideas for measuring plankton in pools, and, um, I'd really be interested in, in talking. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really important kind of avenue to look at. There's definitely the potential for expanding populations. Um, and some are without restoration. Um, basically, these are pools that, that, that seem suitable, but they, um, they don't have dam supplies. We don't know why. It could have just been a stochastic event that, that kind of um, caused them to blink out, but a minimal amount of, of, well, if any, restoration to reestablish. And then there's others with an expense um, that where restoration um, could take place. 
And, and the, the department's already working hard at restoring a lot of the habitats. This is Anahota, where they've already they've cleared out a lot of kiabe, restoring it for cultural sites, but it also is really improving, improving habitat for, um, for not just amplifies, but other animals too, including seabirds. Just want to touch on considerations for the future. I think understanding the naiad biology is really important in limiting factors, whether it's water quality, food availability, predation competition, all those types of things. I think eDNA, I want to touch on that as being really important because we're often seeing dam supplies at these pools, but even if there's um, overposition taking place, we don't know if there's nias that are developing. Um, but they're probably, at least if there's overposition taking place, then, then we can presume that they're probably reproductive pools. But there's other pools where we call them bachelor pools, where there's only males, and it's probably males that are just dispersing out of the core area. But sometimes we see overposition in those pools too, and there's one in particular that I've seen on one occasion over position taking place, but it's got choke puppies in there. So I, I cannot imagine that um, that it's really reproducing is taking place. But if there was like eDNA as a as a tool for for um, for screening for damplified naiads, that would be super important. Um, restoration, peripheral vegetation, meaning that of course everybody knows that the fish removal, and then finally augmenting the population through translocation. I think that that is the next step um, to consider for sure. And um, Will Haynes and his team on Oahu have made a lot of progress on that with, with that Oahu population. And I think um, we're getting close to maybe considering some of that uh, at local and on the coast side. And with that, um, big mahalo. I don't know if there's time for questions, but thank you very much. Hey, mahalo, Bob. Uh, maybe one quick question. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say it would be worse. I think it would both be bad, right? Um, and with the, yeah, for sure, there's little fire ants in the park. They're in the north part of the park. There's no dam supplies there at the time, but for sure the park has concern about it spreading. Um, so I I don't know what's worse. I know the yellow crazy ants are bad, but um, um, yeah, the yellow fire ants are really bad too. Great, right, thank you. Okay.